The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. Enhance your ASIC education with Foundry's hands-on courses. Led by veteran industry instructors, Foundry's three-day mining intensive and five-day mining technician academy programs cover a range of topics, from identifying issues and troubleshooting common hardware failures to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact. Open to enthusiasts and professionals alike, visit www.foundryacademy.com to learn more and sign up for the course that's right for you. Welcome back to the News Roundup, the Mining Pod with Matt Kimmel. We haven't been talking in two weeks. We've had holidays going on. We've not been chatting. Matt, it's great to get behind the great mic to be with back. you again. Yeah, last time I saw you, we were at a mining farm. So that was almost an attempt at recording a podcast. Did not quite work out. But I'm glad we're back to talk about a lot of different things today. We got BlockFi. For that, we're going to talk about difficulty. Also going to talk about Hut8 and Mara hodling and finish up with Manitoba province putting moratorium on mining. But before we get into that, how are you doing? It's been two weeks. I'm doing great. Ready to be back talking mining, knock out some news stories. A lot of stuff's been happening, so excited to keep the conversation going. Love it. Love it. Short and sweet, which is what our audience wants. They don't want to hear about our personal lives. They just want to hear about mining news, and we respect that. They're people of business. Okay, let's talk about difficulty. Give us the update. Expecting a large difficulty drop, which is great for miners who are still online and maybe for some who want to come back online. Yeah, significant adjustment coming up. Uh, Should be at at the time of recording here, December 5th, looks to be uh, about an 8% reduction, which is the largest since um, China banned mining in, in, I think, June 2021. So certainly significant what it means for miners is that the sort of block rewards uh, are being sort of redirected to uh, some of the surviving miners, right? Machines are being unplugged, rewards that would be going to some miners that are likely higher on the cost curve that are being sort of marginally squeezed out of the market. Those rewards are going to be redirected to people that um, are sort of lower on the cost curve, right? Or were sort of better capitalized to continue mining, right? So I think. Generally, it's positive. It's just a display of the free market economics that is Bitcoin mining. It's a beautiful thing. I think we'll sort of continue to see like a um, hash rate decline, likely, you know, in my opinion, throughout the last of the year, as we see more and more miners get squeezed out of the market. Um, but what what are your thoughts? Yeah, just like following that line of conversation, 8% decrease is great for miners. We'll see what that reflects in terms of hash price, see where Bitcoin's prices when that drop finally occurs about 450 blocks away from that as of time of recording. For me, it means like where's capitulation? Are we at the bottom here? An 8% decrease in difficulty is significant. Like you said, it's the largest drop since the China ban in t- June 2021. Uh, so looking forward to that, the minor economics are certainly going to get better for many miners out there. Uh, as we were talking before the show started, like is this like marking the bottom in terms of capitulation? Yes, it's a little clickbaity to like talk about that. But at the same time, I think a lot of miners are wondering because they're having to bake often monthly contract payments for energy usage. And you know, a lot of people wish they probably turned off in November because the average S19 was not making money last month. It was not cash flow positive. And so I think some people are looking at December and being like, oh, maybe I should turn off for December and not keep my units online. But this difficulty drop might tantalize people to keep online because you might be able to eke out a little bit and pay off your energy costs. But I'll hand it back to you. You had some more thoughts on difficulty and if this is Indeed, the bottom. Yeah, I mean, I, so you're right. Minor capitulation is something that's often talked about. I think it's seen often as an indicator to investors, right? Potentially marking a bottom and like a beginning of a recovery. I would sort of say this: the semantics behind that, the logic, is that um, hash rate coming offline is like directly people unplugging machines, right? And net hash rate coming online, right? Um, So a lot more coming offline than there is online. Um, And typically at that point, if you're surrendering, you're leaving the market, you're exiting, you've already sold most of your assets or you are currently selling your assets. Um, And one of the more liquid ones that a miner could have is Bitcoin, right? And so... The question for a lot of investors is, is the added sell pressure from miners abating 
now. Um, we know that miners like to hold Bitcoin. They're generally bullish and sort of the added sell pressure from miners in Bitcoin markets in times of distress, um, that sort of being relieved could sort of, uh, you know, mark the bottom, so to speak, as it has in past cycles. I'm not convinced that this is, you know, the maximum point of pain or the maximum surrender point. Um, I guess it's worth noting that minor capitulation, miners have been capitulating for a while, right? Evidence of that is the lawsuits, the layoffs, the um, the bankruptcies of some of the major players in the space, right? But I think the timing that everybody wants to see is, is it the maximum point of surrender where there's that extra supply that's on the books um, for these miners cannot be, you know, sold anymore. Um, I mean, what do you think? Are you think that that this is it, and and it's it's time for for recovery? I think it would be nice, but I don't think we're quite there yet. I, mean, I think we just kind of languish for a while, and it's a slow burn for uh, people to eke out of the market. I think the big and best players right now are those and big, I mean like the ones who are going to be bigger later, the ones who are doing the best right now are those who are buying energy on the margin for very cheap and just able to print Bitcoin for a little bit under what Bitcoin's price is right now and make uh, some profit. Let's move over to BlockFi, which is you know, talking about capitulation. BlockFi filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy earlier this week. Definitely expected on the heels of FTX because FTX have been propping up BlockFi. BlockFi was hit very hard by the 3AC Terra Luna debacle back in May and June. And FTX extended a $500 million and FTX extended a $500 million line of revolving credit for BlockFi in order to keep the operation afloat. And it seemed like that was going to work until FTX itself popped and went belly up over the last few weeks. So BlockFi filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. For the Bitcoin mining space, this has a lot of implications. Of course, it does for Bitcoiners as well, for Bitcoiners who had funds on BlockFi or Bitcoiners who were using BlockFi for whatever reason. Uh, there's definitely a tough scene there. But for Bitcoin miners, they're often taking loans out from BlockFi. Uh, BlockFi was apparently the second largest lender to Bitcoin miners, according to research from the Block. The public loans that we know of are to BitFarms, Core Scientific, and Cypher Mining. Of those three, the most notable, I think, are Core Scientific and BitFarms. Cypher Mining, according to new reporting from Coindesk, as of today, December 1, or December 2nd, rather, shows that Cypher Mining has been paying off its debt with no issues, and they've actually just turned online a hefty amount of exahash in their new Texas facility. So they seem to be above board. But for BitFarms and Core Scientific, the question becomes a little bit more nuanced. We know that BitFarms has been paying off its debt. They have a decent amount of loans out still standing. Uh, their numbers consistently month over month are actually very high. So I'm not super worried about them. But it should be noted that they have a decent amount of loans with high interest rates. And those are hard to pay off when Bitcoin's price is so low and difficulty so high. The last is Core Scientific, which itself might be going to Chapter 11 soon. They issued a warning back in October saying that they might not be able to pay off debts for a few of their facilities. At the same time, they continue to plan or they continue to mine Bitcoin. Um, So I think we could have a case here of two companies going through Chapter 11 with different credits and debts on each other's balance sheets. But I'll throw it over to you to get your take on this story. Yeah, I mean, for BlockFi, it seems like much of the same story. You know, BlockFi's general model is they they commingle um, client funds, right? People deposit on the BlockFi exchange. They take those assets, they try to earn money with it, and they pass some sort of yield on to their clients, right? Um, part of their strategy was to make ASIC-backed loans. It's clear... I mean, the, the filing for BlockFi has come out, right? And the announcement is, I think they have $256 million in cash on hand um, and anywhere from $1 to $10 billion in liabilities. I'm sure we'll learn more about that in the coming weeks. So their situation, I mean, to be generous is precarious, right? It's not very good. Um, what it means for miners is really much of the same. The loan agreements that they have... Um, undertaken, in my view, they're, they're not going to change, right? The terms are, are going to continue. Um, if they cannot meet their obligations, right? If they have cash flow problems, income issues, liquidity issues, and they cannot service their debt payments to BlockFi, 
I mean, it just kind of adds to the fire uh, that BlockFi is sort of going through currently because, you know, with ASIC backed loans, they would then have to take the machine collateral. Right. And then you have you have several challenges on the on the side of BlockFi. You need uh, inventory space to sort of hold the machines. Right. Do you have the feasibility and the relationships to then liquidate these machines and sort of get value for you for them that you estimated uh, you would have when you originally undertaken those loans? That question's still in the air, but I would assume likely not, uh, given how f- much uh, the price of ASICs has reduced since November 2021. I mean, it's it, I think it's uh, around 80 percent, maybe even more. Will, uh, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think you're definitely spot on there. And I think this brings into question the purpose and role of ASIC back loans. I just did a podcast on this with Glenn Jones, Vice Breaker Finance. So a little shill to my own podcast here. But definitely everyone should go check that out. And the conversation ended up there discussing like how do ASIC back loans work in the future? Are they pristine collateral? Is there pristine collateral in Bitcoin mining? Given that most things are cyclical in the same manner, most things uh, as collateral that you can use are not great during a drawdown. So what do you use? Uh, his Glenn Jones's opinion there was just, hey, we should use like a mix of collateral. We should use a blend of collateral and try to find some collateral in that stack that's anti-cyclical. But for ASIC back loans, especially for some of these deals that were drawn up, they just look horrendous. I mean, you have two-year term loans, high interest rates, and then its first security is on that ASIC itself. So if something's going bad with that loan, you're going to try and go take that ASIC off a shelf. Well, you can't take in 50,000 ASICs at the same time. I think NIDIG is learning that right now. NIDIG gave out a bunch of loans. A bunch of people are now reneging on them or defaulting on them. And NIDIG can't just handle like 1,000 ASICs at a time. They're having to handle like 50,000 at a time. So what do they do with all these ASICs? We're going to have to see. And that's part of the reason you're seeing difficulty draw down because a lot of these public miners or miners who are using lending to stand up their facilities are now going through liquidations and those machines are coming offline. It's going to be messy. Uh, I think we have to also look at some of the other books, Galaxy Digital, Foundry, um, Silvergate, uh, B. Riley, a few other lenders out there. They look fairly healthy. Uh, Of course, we don't know all the details and probably won't because we're just seeing stuff through headlines or public filings. They do look fairly healthy. I think the one to watch is maybe Foundry because of its relationship to Genesis, but new reporting from Coindesk this morning showed that it's actually fairly healthy. So we'll just have to keep an eye on all of that. Any last thoughts before we go on to talk about Hut 8 and Marathon? I think you summed it up well. I, it's not unreasonable to expect that some of the issues that miners are facing could flow into the lending space. That's my last word on it. Yeah, definitely the lending space has been the thing to watch as this cycle is drawn down. And miners who are leveraged with debt from that are um, you know, in the in the thick of it. Talking about Hut 8 and Marathon, Hut 8 and Marathon are the two only public miners who have not sold any of their Bitcoin so far. Marathon Digital has been using it to over collateralize a loan uh, from Silvergate, both a term loan and a revolving line of credit. And then uh, I believe Hot A has been doing a similar thing where they use it for loans, over collateralized loans. The question here is, does that continue to make sense as Bitcoin's price draws down? And at what point are they forced to sell their Bitcoin to cover costs? We're still waiting on updates from both of them for December. We'll probably get those in the next week. But it is interesting to watch and it's interesting to think about the strategy. Most other miners have sold at this point. Iris... Clean Spark, a few others decide to sell throughout the last cycle. And that seemed to be actually a very smart decision because they were able to take advantage of a higher Bitcoin price. And then some others decided not to sell at all until they were forced to. Core Scientific and Argo and a few others. And those miners somewhat speak for themselves in the fact that strategy did not work out too well. I want to get your thoughts on Hut 8 and Marathon, though. It, I mean, it's a microcosm because it's just two companies, but it's kind of an example of what we were just talking about in the previous segment of miners being forced to sell their Bitcoin on balance sheet because of adverse market conditions, right? Because their economic situation has changed in a distressed market and they now need cash on hand. How do you do that quickly? Liquid Bitcoin holdings, right? And uh, I believe you mentioned here, but it's it's Bitcoin backed loans, right? So they may be forced in kind of another way, not just because they need to sell their Bitcoin to just finance ongoing operations, but because they need to pay back on their loans and they essentially get sort of margin called 
Um, so, it, I mean, it'll be interesting to watch for sure because they have a significant amount of Bitcoin. Um, I think Marathon has over 10,000 coins, right? Not This isn't necessarily a small amount. Um, it's not going to have a, a, a crazy significant effect on Bitcoin markets generally, right? Its market cap's big enough. It has enough liquidity to where it's not going to cause some sort of major slippage. But it's a significant amount of Bitcoin nonetheless. It, it is uh, will potentially have some effect, I guess. Yeah, according to BitcoinTreasuries.net, Marathon Digital has 10,055 Bitcoin as of time of publishing, and Hut 8 has 7,406 Bitcoin. And I believe both of them use them to over collateralize loans. Uh, at the very least, Marathon Digital definitely does. And in that case, it can be beneficial. It can also be negative for yourself, right? So like if Bitcoin's price goes up, well, then you get to take advantage of that. You can take some Bitcoin uh, out of that loaning profile and use it for payments on machines or paying off debts or whatever you want to use it for. But if Bitcoin's price goes down, then you have to put more Bitcoin to collateralize that position. And uh, if Bitcoin's price does continue to go down, then we do know that these loans could be in question, including being margin called. And that would leave you with very little recourse on what to do next. So something definitely to watch if things continue to get worse in terms of Bitcoin's price. These are the two loans to watch. Of course, we're all cheering that Bitcoin's price does not get worse. So hopefully everything here stays above board. Let's move up over only, to... I thought. I thought it was up only. only. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it is crypto winter. It is crypto winter. It's not happening. Let's move over to our last story for the day, which is Canada, Canada's Manitoba province setting an 18-month moratorium on new crypto mining projects in the country, citing the possibility of the local grid being overwhelmed, according to a new report from Coindesk. This is going to pause or slow down the development of any new crypto mines in the region. There's been about 4.6 gigawatts of requests from miners to plug into Manitoba. This mirrors other instances of moratoriums on crypto mining projects we've seen. Washington State back in the day, back in like 2017, 2018, and then most recently with New York signing that bill for two-year moratorium on Bitcoin mining in the state. Yeah, I, I first like preface what I'm going to say. I think anyone that takes a sort of careful look at Bitcoin mining and its effect in energy systems and on the environment and on the environment, it's pretty clear that it has a lot of potential and actually can have a positive impact, right? This story more so, um, I think, is sort of about how local government policy is really going to shape um, regulatory view on Bitcoin mining, right? And on proof of work generally. We've seen this in the United States a lot. It's kind of a state's rights thing. New York thinks of things differently than Wyoming, then thinks of differently than Texas, then thinks of differently from North Carolina, right? And so uh, Manitoba, right? This isn't a federal mor moratorium within um, Canada. It's within Ma Manitoba itself. They sort of feel like there's enough um, mining on their grid, right? It's a very capital uh, energy intensive industry, right? I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing or a no-no. They're not um, kicking everybody out of Manitoba that is currently Bitcoin mining there like China did last year. They're just saying, okay, we're good. We don't want any more applications. We have enough of that here. And I don't think they should be chastised for that. Yeah, I think definitely part of the issue with this Manitoba scene is not only the high demand for miners to move to the region, but also that the local utility is in a debt issue. And they're not quite sure how to do this. Uh, bringing new demand to the grid necessarily means that the utility has more demand for its services. And I think they need some work on that. The one thing I want to draw the parallel here is what's going on with ERCOT in Texas. Uh, we know that there's been a huge demand, gigawatts, like similar amounts of gigawatts of demand on the Texas grid for miners going there. And it's been in sort of like a marketing point or something that a lot of people have been clapping at, being like, this is a good thing for a Texas grid. But if you look at also the number of companies that are bankrupt or going bankrupt, and have mines on the Texas grid right now, like it also stacks up to be gigawatts. And that puts a bad taste in the mouth of regulators and utilities who are not pro-Bitcoin necessarily. They're probably just neutral at very best. And now they're, hand they're dealing with all these miners who are going bankrupt. So we'll throw up that image here on the screen, but it's a pretty interesting situation to watch unfold where these public utilities are having to handle a bunch of Bitcoin miners, be enthusiastic, come to the grid, and then 18 months later are going bankrupt. Definitely a bad scene to watch. Give it to you for last thoughts on the subject, though. 
I think it's going to be interesting to see how this develops on kind of a local government level. And it's definitely um, something I'm going to be paying attention to here in Texas. Yeah, I'll give last thought on it. I think that this is going to be sort of the long tail effect from a social perspective that Bitcoin miners might not be ready for. There are thousands of projects with hundreds of thousands of people, maybe not hundreds of thousands, but definitely thousands of people who are employed in Bitcoin mining and might not be longer employed by the Bitcoin mining industry because of this drawdown. And that's going to leave a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. So that's something I'm sort of holding onto a thesis going into crypto winter is yes, the Bitcoin mining industry might not be welcome in a lot of places in the next two years because, hey, they built projects and then they didn't, economics didn't work out and now they're gone. And I think that's the legacy of anything that's super cyclical like Bitcoin markets are. This has happened in many industries over the last, you know, actually all over human history. history. I think the railroad industry is probably the, the best uh, similarity here where a lot of railroad projects were built. Some survived, some did not but definitely left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth. I hope you're wrong. There are a lot of cyclical industries that are still out there, like the shipping industry, for example. It, it We could become accustomed to it, but I mean, it's on the miners to um, be more prudent and uh, have better treasury management strategies so they don't lay off as many employees and go bankrupt, right? Um, but they, they are like free market economics are at play here. Um, sort of Bitcoin is working as usual, um, it's really just the second order effects of those, I think, um, that you're speaking about, which is it's interesting to follow. Classic research analyst throwing out buzzwords and phrases like second order effects. All right, we'll leave it there. That was Matt Kimmel. Welcome back to the News Roundup. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Next week, we have some more great Bitcoin mining podcasts and interviews with some people in the space. So stay tuned for those. We will see you next week. Cheers.